On this Tuesday night, the eve of an unprecedented presidential inauguration, amped up security for a scaled back swearing in. I'm truly honored to be your next president. The eerie atmosphere in Washington, D.C. It's very sad. And reflections on the transition of power after a tumultuous four years. Canada's conservative leader pushes out an MP with a controversial history. What's the strategy and why now? And as one province considers easing restrictions. We need to take this cautious approach. Another expands its red alert. Global National with Donna Friesen. In Washington, D.C. tonight, the stage is set for the inauguration of the 46th President of the United States. Thousands of American flags are taking the place of people on the National Mall. The political violence and the pandemic means this inauguration will be unlike any in American history. This evening, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris took part in a ceremony at the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool, where 400 lights were illuminated along the edge of the pool, each light representing 1,000 Americans who have died of COVID-19. To heal, we must remember. It's hard sometimes to remember, but that's how we heal. It's important to do that as a nation. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There will be more troops than American civilians in the streets of Washington for this inauguration. It is traditionally a centerpiece of the peaceful transfer of power, but Washington right now is like a fortress and their fear of more political violence is real. We have complete coverage tonight, beginning with our Washington Bureau Chief, Jackson Prosco. Jackson? Well, Donna, an inauguration is supposed to be a celebration of a new administration, but that's not the case this time around with dual crises facing Joe Biden, the pandemic and national security concerns. Nothing about this inauguration is typical. Instead of cheering crowds, thousands of flags will flutter silently on the National Mall. Questions still linger about whether it's safe to swear in President-elect Joe Biden on the steps of the Capitol. At least a dozen National Guard members who were set to protect the inauguration have been relieved of duty over concerns about potential links to far-right militias. Extremism is not tolerated in any branch of the United States military. I know these are dark times, but there's always light. An emotional Biden is pressing ahead. Tears stream down his face as he bid farewell to friends and supporters in Delaware before departing for Washington. Excuse the emotion. But when I die, Delaware will be written on my heart. At the White House, President Trump has spent his final days in seclusion, recording a farewell message to supporters that still does not mention Biden by name. This week, we inaugurate a new administration and pray for its success in keeping America safe and prosperous. Trump is the first president in more than 150 years to shun the swearing-in of his successor, despite receiving the courtesy himself four years ago. And to not do it, I think, is really leaving a blank in democracy and really hurting the exercise of this extremely wonderful moment. Trump still refuses to acknowledge he lost the election as he faces the prospect of a post-presidential impeachment trial for inciting the mob that stormed the Capitol. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. On his last day in office, it's clear Trump's influence is waning as Republican leaders plot how to move on USA! from the lie that fractured the nation toward a new president who has promised unity. Trump will receive a formal send-off tomorrow morning as he departs for his new life in Florida. But in a sign of how isolated he is in these final 24 hours in office, his vice president, Mike Pence, will not be there to see him off. Instead, Pence will be right here at the Capitol building for the inauguration of Joe Biden. Donna? 
will be a remarkable day. Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. The Secret Service is in charge of security at the inauguration, and it has never been more tense. Areas around the White House and the Capitol are locked down. Americans have been told to stay home and watch the whole thing on TV. The FBI has been vetting the thousands of National Guard troops brought in from across the country. The feeling seems to be just get through the day without any political violence. Mike Armstrong is in Washington tonight, too, and gives us a sense of what it's like. They are just about everywhere. National Guard soldiers seem to be on every corner in downtown Washington. So it's like you can't get to work, you can't go nowhere. It's like gated everywhere. It's crazy. The security perimeter around the Capitol and the National Mall is bigger than it's ever been before for an inauguration. And there are more soldiers than ever in history to enforce it. There are 25,000 National Guard this year, more than three times as many compared to Donald Trump's inauguration four years ago, only 8,000. This feels different. Since the pandemic, it's always been like kind of empty, but now it's actually, it's very sad. For businesses in the area, after months of pain from the pandemic, this is another blow. They usually get a bump in inauguration years. For the first Obama inauguration in 2009, hotels were at 97.2% occupancy. The Trump inauguration in 2017 was smaller, but there was also the Women's March the next day. Again, hotels were almost full at 95.2%. Since the January 6th siege at the Capitol, hotels have been busy, but fielding cancellations. Even with the pandemic, there was still a desire to come and witness and be in Washington, D.C. All those, those opportunities went away. Just to give you an idea of what it's like to be here in downtown D.C., we're about three blocks north of the White House. You can see every street is blocked off by National Guard or police. In fact, every alley as well. And then you get another security perimeter, barriers, fencing, more guards. This one you can walk through. But if you do, you end up at another security perimeter, this one being guarded by dozens of National Guard. No one is getting anywhere near Capitol Hill, the National Mall, or the White House right now. One question now is how long this extra security lasts. DC's mayor says she hopes things loosen up after the inauguration, but that she understands that may take a while. The soldiers who've been sent in from every state in the country are still waiting to find out when they'll head home. Don't know. We came a week early. We're here for this week and then uh, we have no plans to go home yet. Now, it will take a while for life here to return to even a semblance of normality. Most businesses downtown have shut down, boarded up and basically said, call me when it's over. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Washington. Global News will have live coverage of the inauguration from Washington, D.C. tomorrow morning at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific. When Joe Biden takes the oath of office tomorrow, he does take on a country in the midst of deep trauma. More than 24 million Americans have now been infected with the coronavirus. More than 400,000 have died. One of the hardest hit regions is California. This week, it became the first state to record more than 3 million cases. In Los Angeles, the COVID situation is so bad, officials say the growing backlog of bodies awaiting cremation has become a public health threat. The air quality regulator in California has temporarily lifted limits on cremations so that more can take place to deal with the backlog. Canada is nowhere near that situation, though public health officials here warn we're still at a dangerous point. And vaccine rollout delays are not helping. The government now says Canada will not receive any Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines next week because of production issues in Europe. Mike Lecouture reports on how the provinces are dealing with the delays. Canada was informed of the decision Tuesday morning, and it came with even more bad news. Uh, there will be considerable impact across all provinces, asymmetric across the board. Uh, the overall impact over the next month um, is in the range of 50% decrease of expected allocations. The delays are being blamed on Pfizer needing to shut down production temporarily so it can expand it significantly. The frontline doctors understand the delay, but it means there's no let up inside the ICU. Having to uh, see our COVID patients go through what they do, you know, having to put on our PPE and, and you see often our nurses and respiratory therapists in a room for 12 hours exhausted, sweating, and, and, and just, you know, having to, to really go the extra mile. 
Now, the delivery delays aren't happening everywhere and not to the same extent. There are reports other countries in Europe have been using political pressure to secure supplies of the vaccine. What are you doing, if anything, to try and put pressure on these companies to actually respect the contracts we've signed? And we continue to work every day reaching out to the top levels of vaccine companies, uh, including uh, myself being involved, to ensure uh, that we are getting uh, the doses we need. Prime Minister Trudeau is trying to reassure Canadians deliveries will ramp back up and Pfizer will hit its target of 4 million doses by the end of March. But Ontario Premier Doug Ford is prodding the Prime Minister to do more. If I was in his shoes, I'm sure he is doing it, but I'd be on that phone call every single day. I'd be up that guy's yin-yang so far with a firecracker, he wouldn't know what hit him from Pfizer. Canadian officials warn the road ahead may not be as smooth as we want it to be, but they're confident everyone who wants a vaccine will be able to get one by the end of September. Donna? All right, Mike LeCouture in Ottawa, thanks. Well, more regions in New Brunswick are moving into red zone restrictions because COVID case counts keep rising. Today, that province reported 31 new infections, one of the biggest daily jumps in New Brunswick, and one more person has died. As of midnight tonight, the Moncton, Fredericton, and St. John regions will move to the red level. That means people must stick to their household bubble and gyms and salons must close. The Premier is warning a full lockdown may be needed if cases keep rising. There may soon be some relief for people in Manitoba. After more than two months of code red restrictions, the province says the curve is now bending down and it's considering loosening some rules. If the plan is approved as early as this Friday, Manitobans will be allowed to invite two additional people into their homes. Up to five people will be able to gather outdoors and retailers and hair salons will be allowed to reopen with precautions in place. We need to take this cautious approach. Um, we know that Manitobans have always worked hard to reduce the transmission of this virus, but we know that uh, the more interactions we have, we, we raise the, the risk. The province says it will make a decision on easing restrictions later this week. Dr. Rusin warned there may be no changes in the northern Manitoba health region, which is more at risk of outbreaks. Turmoil within the Tories coming up, how the party is dealing with a controversial MP. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he will continue to press the incoming Biden administration on the merits of the Keystone XL pipeline expansion. President-elect Joe Biden is poised to make good on his promise to rescind the permit for the project. It's expected to be among the first things he does tomorrow. Today, Trudeau said he is making sure Canada's views are heard. Over the past number of days uh, and continuing today, we are uh, communicating our arguments in favour of Keystone XL uh, directly to the highest uh, levels of this administration. Uh, and we will continue to work closely with them on this and many other uh, initiatives to protect jobs and, uh, and uh, grow the economy in ways that also fight climate change. Biden campaigned on cancelling the permit for the $9 billion pipeline project. It's unlikely anything can save it now. The federal conservative leader is trying to send a strong message about who is not welcome in the party. Aaron O'Toole has started the process to remove MP Derek Sloan from caucus. Sloan has been connected to a string of controversies, and a recent donation from a well-known white supremacist seems to have been the last straw for O'Toole. With me is our Ottawa bureau chief, Mercedes Stevenson. Mercedes, O'Toole can't just kick Sloan out, I understand. What's the process that has to unfold? You're right, Donna. He doesn't have that power as the leader of the Conservative Party. He has to have the majority of MPs in caucus vote for that. And at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning in an emergency caucus session, that is exactly what Conservative MPs are going to be voting on. That's because the Conservatives signed on to something called the Reform Act, which handed the power to make decisions about who should sit in caucus to MPs instead of the leader. Now, that said, Aaron O'Toole has made his position very clear. Take a look at the statement that he 
put out last night, in which he said, racism is a disease of the soul, repugnant to our core values. It has no place in our country, and it has no place in the Conservative Party of Canada. He is the one who has initiated the process to try to remove Sloan, and he has said that he will not allow him to run in the next election. Now, Derek Sloan is defending himself in all this. He says he didn't know it was a notorious white nationalist and neo-Nazi who donated to his campaign, that he donated under a pseudonym and online. That said, Donna, a previous leadership campaign by Kelly Leach caught Paul Fromm trying to do the exact same thing in 2017. And today, Derek Sloan came out and accused Paul Fromm of being a member of the Conservative Party. I can tell you we've just heard back from the Conservative Party, and they confirm that he did, in fact, hold a membership. Listen to what they say. They say Mr. Sloan's campaign, Derek Sloan's campaign, sold the membership to this individual in May. Mr. Sloan's campaign accepted the donation from this individual in August. We are revoking this membership. We are remitting the funds. We also sat down with Derek Sloan today to ask him what he had to say for himself. And here is what he told us. I condemn racist groups. Like, this is not something I'm a part of uh, or in any way associate with. I'm not trying to cause undue uh, issues for people, but right now uh, the knives are pointed at me and I'm going to, I'm going to defend myself. So Sloan vowing to defend himself as he goes forward. We'll see if he survives the vote tomorrow, Donna. I'm hearing from conservative sources that that is unlikely. Mercedes, O'Toole has often supported Derek Sloan in the past. Why is he doing this now? Well, Donna, conservative sources say that this is really about cumulative actions. It's not so much about the donation, which his campaign says they missed. It's about a whole accumulation of behavior and Derek Sloan essentially becoming a political liability to the party. Initially, they thought they needed him because of the social conservative base he represented. But he's just had so many controversies, everything from the petition he brought forward, which questioned whether the vaccines for COVID-19 were human experimentation, to comments about gender ideas identity and beyond. They just can't afford to take the risk of keeping him on board. Okay, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. Accused sex offender Peter Nygaard is back in court for a bail hearing. Nygaard appeared via video link in a Winnipeg courtroom today. Federal lawyers are questioning one of his former executives who is offering him a place to live if he's granted bail. Nygaard was arrested in December under the Extradition Act. He faces nine counts in the U.S., including sex trafficking and racketeering. Nygaard's lawyer argues keeping him in jail where there are COVID-19 cases could be a death sentence for the 79-year-old. Ahead, an expensive painting is discovered stolen after it was found. This highway north of Tokyo became a deadly scene after a blizzard triggered a massive pileup. One person was killed, at least 17 others injured. About 140 vehicles were involved. It stretched over one kilometer. Crews worked for eight hours to free those trapped and clear the wreckage. Bad winter weather has been hitting Japan for weeks and more heavy snow is forecast to fall overnight. Workers trapped in a Chinese gold mine for nearly 10 days have received more medical and food supplies today. The miners are now able to communicate with their rescue workers through a telephone line. Today, they asked for porridge and pickles to be sent down. 22 miners were trapped more than 600 meters underground after an explosion damaged the access shaft on January 10th. At least 12 of them are known to still be alive. They say they're suffering from toxic fumes and rising water levels, though. Wider rescue shafts are now being drilled. Police in Italy have recovered a stolen 500-year-old copy of a Leonardo da Vinci painting that was hidden inside an apartment in Naples, and nobody realized it was missing until it was found. The 16th century copy, thought to be painted by one of da Vinci's students, is normally kept inside this church. The room where the painting was on display had been closed for three months due to COVID-19. There were no signs of a break-in. It's still unknown when the work of art was taken or how. The painting was found in a bedroom cupboard and a 36-year-old man has been arrested. Next, reflections on turning the page on Trump and the challenges ahead. A presidential inauguration is usually a centerpiece of American democracy, showcasing the peaceful transfer of power. This transition, though, has not been peaceful. 
President Trump's years of rhetoric and lies, plus COVID-19, have stirred up turmoil and apprehension. For many Americans, tomorrow can't come soon enough. Here's Eric Sorensen. I know you like me, and this room is a love fest. At times, the presidency of Donald Trump seemed endless. It's now down to hours. Day 1460 of the Trump administration, the transfer of power from Donald Trump taking place in unprecedented conditions. What should have been a tranquil transition to a new president before a day of pomp and optimism for the future has left many Americans shell-shocked, looking now simply for relief an escape. We have been literally under duress in this dire situation of the Trump, you know, spectacle. Because we are really trying to um, sigh and get over the trauma that we've experienced. A tumultuous four years, crowned by a shocking scheme not to transfer power peacefully. This was a fraudulent election. The chilling thought for many was how close Donald Trump came to winning re-election. In the end, his management of the COVID-19 pandemic exposed a president who appeared concerned almost solely for his personal interests. Somebody that leaves a legacy of corruption, somebody that was impeached twice, somebody that incited an insurrection, and somebody that utterly failed on the biggest crisis that he had to see over on his watch, which was the coronavirus pandemic. Atop a pandemic and a fractured economy, there's a political chasm in America that Joe Biden must try to bridge. America's endured much. And we will endure here and we will prevail again. The challenges that President-elect Biden has on his plate are as difficult a set of challenges of any president in modern history. A man clearly not in the prime of life, but right for the moment. He has a huge amount of experience. He has a, a kind of calmness. Uh, about him that I think is very appealing uh, to, to people. Joe Biden will try to fix America at home and repair its standing in the world. I hope that folks in, in Canada and around the world um, give, a, give America a chance under Joe Biden. The country's political wounds are as raw as they've ever been on the eve of a presidential inauguration. The healing under a new president will take time. Eric Sorensen, Global News. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. We leave you with more from the ceremony tonight at the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool in Washington, D.C. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift, the baffled king composing. President-elect Joe Biden paid tribute to the more than 400,000 Americans who have died of COVID-19. Tomorrow, he will be sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow for our live coverage of the inauguration. For now, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.